What a great day of worship, amen? amen. Who's ready to dig into the word? Amen. I don't know if I can follow that though. You all still seem a little tired. Most of you must have been here last night. All right, so there's going to be a lot of scripture. I'm fair warning you today, all right? We're going to go through a lot of scripture, but I'm giving you, well, the Lord's giving you a bunch of weapons to combat some stuff, and that's what I'm going to give you, all right? To combat some things that we're going to talk about. But before we get started, my name's Mike. If we haven't met yet, I would love to meet you after service. Come up front, and I can chat with you. Um, if you are new here, we've been going through a series called Jesus Stories for quite a while right now. And we're going over the miracles of Jesus, the miracles that you find in the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or otherwise known as the Gospels. And it's no different today. We're going to find our story. I'm kind of covering two stories, so hopefully Pastor Adam doesn't get mad at me for that one. But uh, they go together and they tie in so well, all right? So in Luke 17, uh, we're going to find the story we're going to talk about mostly here. Let me turn to that real quick. All right, Luke 17, verse 11. Let's start it off. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten men with leprosy who stood at a distance met him. They raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw what had been he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. But Jesus responded and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up. Go, your faith has made you well. Let us pray. Father God, I just thank you, Father. I thank you for who you are. I thank you and give you all the glory because you're worthy of it, Father God. Father, I pray right now that your words are heard, Father. Shut my mouth, whatever doesn't need to be heard, and just let me say whatever it is that you want to be said. Father, I pray that you soften the hearts of those in here. Open our ears to hear and receive what it is that you have for us today, Father God. I thank you in advance for the lives that are going to be changed and transformed and set free, Father God. And we give you the glory, we give you the thanks in advance for that, Father. Not for the miracles, not for anything, but just for who you are. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's what I've entitled this message today was Give Thanks. All right, and there's so much to be thankful for. I mean, the grace of God alone to be thankful for, amen? But so often we look and we give thanks for these material things in our life, for our health, right? Um, I mean, we can give thanks right now just for being able to be in here right now, right? For having shelter, a building to worship, strength, food, water, we can give thanks for them. We think in this material aspect so often, but there's so much more at a deeper level to give thanks for. I mean, we can give thanks for his love, for the Father's love for each and every one of us in here. I mean, for Christ coming back to redeem us, to die on the cross for each and every one of you in here. I mean, for the forgiveness that he gives each and one of us, I mean, myself included, because I do some dumb stuff. Right? I mean, but that forgiveness that he gives us, not asking for anything in return, but just to love him. I mean, the hope that we have in him, the peace that we have in him, there's so much to be thankful for other than just this material aspect. Amen? Let's break down these verses. So let's start with verse 12. He's, it says, and as he entered a village, ten men with leprosy who stood at a distance met him. So what is leprosy? It was this disease back then. Um, it began with like specks on the eyelids or on the palms, gradually spreading over the body, turning the hair white. Um, those affected areas would crust, causing terrible sores, terrible swelling. 
And this disease, it started on the skin, but then worked itself inwards to the bones, and then eventually rotting the whole body, right? And as you would imagine, this would make somebody unclean, right? Um, an outcast to society, somebody that somebody didn't want to be around, somebody that you stood at from a distance. How do we know that? Because his word says so. It says, who stood at a distance, right? They stood at a distance from him. But what's important to realize is this disease that you see here is that physical representation of what sin can do to your body spiritually. Let that soak for a second, what I just talked about, rotting, right, to the inside, to the bones. It's that physical representation. It can eat you alive if you allow it. Just like Pastor Adam talked about last week, he said, you cannot live in open sin and then expect the relationship with the Father. I mean, do we stumble? Yeah. Are we perfect? I say so, but I'm not. I'm not perfect, right? Do we have blind spots in our life? We have blind spots, but they're called blind spots for a reason. We don't see them, right? You can't see them. You need people around you to help you in those areas of your life, right? To sow into you, to lovingly speak life into you and help you see those. Stop saying I'm not convicted of things also. If it's in here, <laughs> if it's in the Bible, that's conviction enough. All right, his word is conviction enough. So stop I just don't feel that. It, if it's here, it's there, all right? So that's why small groups, we just had our small groups fair. We just are in, in the beginning of this semesters of small groups, I encourage you to get plugged in. That's where you're going to find that true life, that somebody that can come alongside of you, that ironing, sharpening iron, right? And giving you what it is that you truly need, not what you need to hear. And sometimes you got to have those hard conversations, amen? So Luke 17, 13. They raise their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. You see, there was no cure for this disease. Other than that which was a divine healing by the grace of God. And they knew this. And they probably have heard about it or seen him do some of this to others with this disease. If we go earlier, remember I always like to go and look at all of scripture, right? Compare it with everything. Don't just take one verse. Look at Luke 5. This is another case of healing. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He knew only Jesus could heal him. But the thing about it was, it was only by the will of the Father. Jesus did not do anything apart from what the Father wanted him to do. He didn't go out on his own. He didn't do his own thing. He was attached to the Father and whatever the Father wanted him to do. So in Luke 5, 13 through 14, it says, and he reached out with his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed, and immediately the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell no one, saying, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. So you see, this is the same thing we see in our scripture today. This is why it's so important to look at all of scripture. I mean, it's even to the same verse. Luke 5, 14 talks about the exact same thing with the leprosy as a Luke 17, 14. Check it out. Luke 17, 14, when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. You heard that before, right? Same exact thing. And as they were going, they were cleansed. So it's important. In Leviticus, in the Old Testament, chapters 13 and 14, it's all about this disease of leprosy. And it's all a bunch of laws, not how to cure it, not the answer for the cure, but it's all about laws in chapter 13. What to do in different stages, different things, what it looks like, and those things include to go to the priest. Well, in Leviticus 14, this is an amazing thing that you see. In Leviticus 14, he puts in there what to do if you're cleansed of leprosy. I just told you there's no cure for it. 
Go, so God beforehand knew, hey, I'm going to give myself a spot of what to do if I'm going to do some work. He knew beforehand and he put it in there in chapter 14. These are the things to do. One of them was to, to go to the priest. So you see they had to do a bunch of stuff in the Old Testament. Now they just put their faith, hope, and trust into Jesus. But he still wanted them to go to the priest. Remember the law is still in effect at this time, right? But Jesus is telling them, because when Jesus came back and he died on that cross, that's when the law was fulfilled. And remember that, that's important. It's fulfilled, not abolished, not taken away, but fulfilled. And that's why he's telling them, amen. And that's why he's telling them to go to the priest at this point. So we keep reading in Luke 5, right after he tells them to go to the priest, and this is in Luke 5. But the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. He wasn't about spectacles, right? It wasn't about him. It was about what the Father wanted him to do. And the only way for him to be doing what the Father wanted him to do, he had to slip away, he had to pray, he had to soak in the presence of the Father, he had to be in touch with the Father. Some of you feel out of touch with the Father. Some of you can't hear what the Father's trying to say to you because you're so in touch with the phones. There's some harsh words in this message today, I'm sorry. And it hits me just as hard. The iPhone gives you these new reports and tells you your screen time. And if your screen time is so much on Facebook and not a lot of Bible stuff, there's a problem. But that's why you're out of touch. You need to slip away. You need to get away. You need to Sabbath. You need to spend time in the presence of the Father soaking. Can I tell you, you're going to hear him a lot more in this than on Facebook. You're gonna hear him a lot more in this than on video games. You're gonna hear him a lot more by reading his word than you will audibly hear him, literally like I'm talking to you. I'll tell you that. His word's living. This is how he speaks to you. Dig into it, spend time with him. So in these two, this is why I said they're so tied together and they're so perfectly together. In these two chapters, in chapter 5 and chapter 17, Jesus heals in two different ways. He does not heal the same way. Is he dealing with the same disease? He's dealing with leprosy. One man's got it, these ten have it. And he does something completely different in each one. In chapter 5, he touches the man. In chapter 10, he speaks it. He speaks it, they walk away, and as they walk away, they're healed. We cannot put Jesus in a box. We can't. We can't say this is the way it's going to be. This is how he's going to operate each and every single time in this situation. We can't do that. You cannot put him in a box. We see it here. He does it in two separate ways. Let me tell you a story in the natural of how I can think of this. Some of you in here may like to play cards. I love to play cards. I love strategy games. Strategy games are fun to me. Um, So when we were back on vacation, we were playing this game, this card game called Hearts. All right? There's a lot of rules to it. There's a lot of strategy to it. But somebody that was playing with us didn't understand the game. So I was trying to give them the rules, the basics of it, right? And then they would ask, well, what would I do in this situation? And I'd be like, well, depends. What cards do I have? What cards do I think you have? What's been played? What do I think you have? Who's leading? There's so many different things that could go with it. I can give you the basics, but I can't tell you exactly what to do. What they wanted was a goldfish. Hey, do you have a two? No, draw one. That's what they wanted was what's this? We can't do that. We try to do that with the Holy Spirit, right? We can have basics. We can have the guidelines. We can have the um, procedures and all the basic rules that we want to talk about. But when it comes down to it, Holy Spirit's going to do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Right? There's nothing that we can do about that aspect, right? Now, we are prepared. There are procedures. There's our rules. There are all these things, but we can't just put it in this box and call it this way. Amen? So in chapter 17, he speaks it. The ten are healed as they're walking away to see the priest. But one of them does 
something truly, truly amazing. Right? In 15, Luke 17, 15 through 16, this guy turns around. He says, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, think about this. He's walking away from Jesus to go to the priest. And he's like, whoa, I'm healed. I mean, right, he, like, he, he notices that as he's leaving him. It wasn't right there. Jesus like, go to the priest. They're going away. I'm healed. He doesn't carry on with his day. What's he do? It says this. He turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. So in chapter 5, after Jesus healed that guy, crowds came chasing after him. Because they're chasing after him for this healing, right? They wanted their sickness. They wanted all this stuff taken away. They're chasing after the gift, right? But here in 17, this man comes back to give thanks. He's chasing after the giver in this aspect. He didn't want nothing else, nothing else that he wanted but to just give thanks for what Jesus had done for him. What's even better is that it's a Samaritan. It's a Samaritan. They did not associate with the Jews at all. They were separate from the Jewish church. They didn't have a great understanding of what the true worship, true knowledge of God was. But it was the Samaritan, the person that you didn't think, the most unlikely person that you think in your mind came back to give thanks to Jesus. And this is what Jesus says. But Jesus responded and said, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? So I talked about this last week in our journey Bible class, which meets at 1115 during the second service up front. That's a shameless plug for that class. But... <laughs> However, I talked about it in there. You can have all the head knowledge you want. You can quote all the scripture you want to quote. And you can memorize the first five books like the Pharisees did. And you can know this thing inside and out and be a very awful, angry, upset person. Because you're not applying it to your everyday life. And I'm saying that to myself just as much as each and every one of you out there. We have to take what we read, what we get from the Father, what we get from his word, and apply it to our life. You see, he came back and gave thanks. And because of this, Jesus says this to him in 19. And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. There is always an action step to the faith. You see it with Abraham when he's taking his son up to kill him in the Old Testament. There's always an action to the faith. This action was him coming back and just giving thanks. Nothing major, coming back and giving thanks. So you see, he received so much more than just physical healing that day. He received that eternal salvation that day. And so these guys with this incurable disease that they could not cure on their own by any chance called out to Jesus, put their faith, hope, and trust into Jesus, and they were healed. There's some of you in here right now that are dealing with an incurable disease that can only be overcome by the blood of the lamb, can only be overcome by a touch from the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Or him speaking it over you as he did with these two, with these ten. And these incurable diseases that we're going to talk about are not what you're probably thinking of. So I want to give you a little bit of my testimony that I really haven't shared. This part that I really have not shared with anybody really. But I know there's people in here that need to hear this. But most importantly, I know that people are hearing a different story about what they need to do for this incurable disease. 
And I know some of these words that I'm going to share here in a few are going to be a little harsh, all right, but I'm speaking out of love when I share these words with you. Because the topics that I'm going to talk about here are huge, they're big, they're big in the world because the world's getting crazier and crazier and crazier every day. And I can speak on these three topics that I'm going to talk about because I'm coming from a place from a guy with one leg sitting in a wheelchair that got ran over by an F-450, that's a big truck, crushed my pelvis, destroyed my bladder, destroyed my bowel, right, that puts a 41-year-old guy, 42, something like that, old guy in a wheelchair that sits in a diaper in front of you. But I can come from this point. And I do have a leg to stand on when it comes to this. So just as Jesus was the cure for leprosy back then, he is the only answer for anxiety, depression, and PTSD. You see, anxiety, PTSD, depression, I've been diagnosed with every single one of those things. I've had them. And God's been putting this on me for the past month to talk about this. He's been telling me you need to share your story. People need to hear it. I thought it was just really, uh, that was just really for me because this is my kind of personality. But you need to hear it. Some of you have been diagnosed with this. Some of you have been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, PTSD, all of them, one of them. It doesn't matter, right? Just like I have been. But the problem is you're listening to what the doctors are telling you right? And you're not listening to what the word says. You're listening to them telling you, I need this medicine or that medicine or this or that. Can I tell you, you are treating a symptom and not the cure for the root problem. I'm not telling you to stop taking your medicines. I'm not telling you any of this stuff, right? I'm not a doctor. I love doctors. They saved my life. I mean, by the grace of God, right? But he used the doctors to save my life. So I'm telling you, dig into this, and then you can work with your doctor and probably get off those medicines. Because that's what I did. You will never be completely healed by just taking medicines alone. And stop, please, stop listening, because I've heard it. People tell you, well, it's just... God's made you this way, and you just got to deal with some of this stuff. He has not made you to live in mental hell. Now, I can tell you that most of the time, I can't say every root problem, because some of you add your own anxiety to you because you can't leave the house 10 minutes earlier. So some of you add your own anxiety to things. But, however, most of the time and every time with PTSD, the root problem is something in your life happened, some event has taken place that you want to be erased. I know. That's what I wanted. I was in the hospital, right? You want this thing to be erased. And if you're honest with yourself, if you're in here, and if you have one of these things, that's what you want. Truly, deep down in your heart of hearts, you want that memory gone. You don't want to think about it. You want it to be like it never happened. But it took a God-fearing woman down in Tampa who was, I don't know if she was a psychiatrist, psychologist, whoever can't prescribe medicine. I get them confused. She literally looked at me and she said, suck it up. It ain't going away. Live in spite of it. Now, those are harsh words. And she's going to tell you that first part she didn't say, but she said it. (laughs) The last part she did say, she said, you have to live in spite of it. She looked at me and she said, look down. (laughs) She's like, you're not going to wake up one day and go, where did my leg go? You're going to remember it. It's not going to get wiped from your memory. That's not how it works. How do we live in spite of this? 
So how do we do it? The Bible tells us. All right, the Bible tells us. And I'm no different than either one of you, any one of you in here today. I've just learned some things, and I've learned where my joy comes from. See, joy is not equated to happiness. I can be sad and have joy. Right? My joy is not found in this world. Can I tell you that if you don't have your joy, if you've lost your joy, it can be restored? Psalms 51. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Joy is found in the presence. Psalms 16. You will make known to me the way of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Joy is found in delighting in God's word. Psalm 119. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Those last two are prayer and getting into his word. Soaking in him like I talked about earlier. That's where you can find the joy. And when you are with him, the Holy Spirit, it leads you to this, the fruit. Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then in verse 25 it says, if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. I've learned where my strength comes from. Psalms 121. I will raise my eyes to the mountains. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Stop looking at earthly things for your help. People can come aside of you and help you, but ultimately your help comes from the Lord. I've learned where my protection comes from. 2 Thessalonians, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Because I know where my battle's at. And I know what my battle's against. My battle's in my mind. That's where the battle's at for every single one of these. That battle is in your mind. And it's not against natural things. It's against things not of this world. Paul tells us in Ephesians, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the worldly forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. It is not against natural things, but he gives us the weapons of our warfare right afterwards. In 14 he says, stand firm therefore, having belted your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, Having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which will extinguish all the darts of the enemy, his word says the weapons will be formed. What it says is they will not prosper. They will not prosper because you put on your armor every day, you take up the shield of faith, and you stand firm in your faith to extinguish all those darts that come your way. You take up that helmet of salvation to protect that mind from what the enemy is trying to do. You stand firm on that salvation. Stop listening to them tell you, uh, you're not saved, you may not be sad. No, you stand firm on your salvation. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. And then you pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But some people think of that as an offensive weapon. Can I tell you, Jesus used the word of God, the sword of the spirit, three times when he was in the wilderness. He got baptized. He was put into the wilderness for 40 days, led by the Holy Spirit. And three times he was tempted by Satan. And he used it in a defensive measure to defeat the enemy. The word of God is what you need to get into. So you need to take every thought captive because it is in the mind. See, I tell people, you have to not, you, you cannot let the environment affect how you are. You need to affect that environment. You need to be the change in that environment. You need to be the change for good in that environment. And that's why taking every thought captive is how you do that. Second Corinthians tells us, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle according to the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortress. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That literally talks about everything from Ephesians to taking every thought captive. He's talking about our battles not with the flesh. He's telling us our weapons are not of the flesh. And he's telling us to take care or take every thought captive. Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And good is giving people what they need to hear and not just what they want to hear sometimes. Philippians 4, 8. This is a great, great verse. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true... Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about those things. That's how you take every thought captive. So if there was somebody in the Bible that I could think of that truly should have anxiety, should be depressed, should have PTSD if it was a thing back then, right? Is Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph's brother threw him in a pit, sold him, lied to their father about him being dead. He was then accused of raping somebody, which he didn't do. Thrown into the prison... Then, because he can interpret dreams, because God's allowed him to, became second to Pharaoh, and listen to what he says when he meets up with his brothers again. Genesis 45. Now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. He's thinking about them. He's thinking about them. Because you sold me here. Some of you would go fight. Some of you would throw punches. But he says no. For God sent me ahead of you to save lives. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. So God sent me ahead of you to ensure for you a remnant on the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Talk about the right focus. I talked about the right focus a couple sermons ago. You have the right focus. You can walk on water like Peter did. He had the right focus on what the reasons were and what his purpose was and what his calling was. He wasn't focusing all that other negativity that the enemy was trying to throw it his way. Let me give you another story more recently in the natural this is a story about my son, Ethan, all right? So last week, he went on vacation uh, with a, some friends from the church, and he was gone for a week. And I think it was like day one or day two. Now, this kid, when I say PTSD, he's traumatized by the sight of blood. Because when he was up here, when he was little as a kid, he hurt himself, had stitches in his chin, and the sight of blood, just he doesn't like the sight of blood anymore. But he was on a trip, and this is like day two, I said. He's playing ping pong late at night, goes to get a ball. There was an electrical outlet uh, on the wall, like a fuse box. He hits his head on it, and he's bleeding, right? And I get bits and pieces of these stories, but it's late at night for us. We don't answer our phone. Caitlin comes in. Hey, Mom and Dad, you need to call these guys. The, Ethan hurt himself. Now, there was a little anxiety that came up. Right, but we calmed ourselves real quick at that. We got a hold of him. He's on the phone. They've taken great care of him like it's their own son, right? Um, they've taken care of him. We're on the phone with him. We get to pray with him. We get to love on him. We get to calm him and all these things. And throughout this entire process, Ethan, at the end of it, he goes, I felt the Holy Spirit over me. He said, he said I felt the Holy Spirit over me. And I don't want to ever forget this. And when I'm a pastor one day, I want to preach about this. 
God used that moment, because that boy would have ran to mommy. We all, we're mama's boys, right? But mama wasn't there. The Holy Spirit was there, right? Now, he had a lot of mamas around him and people that took care of him and stuff. But the Holy Spirit, God used that for Ethan. But most importantly, there was somebody down there that needed to see that, right? So here's the amazing thing in this whole story. There was a nurse down there. And this nurse came at like the right time, I'm told. Like it, was, it wasn't known when or whatever, but it was a sister that really needed to see the love of Christ in action. And God used it not to touch just Ethan, but most importantly, to show the love of Christ to the nurse that was there, right? To the sister that was there. And she had her jump bag and everything, was able to put glue on it and all this stuff. Went right into action, right? But God put everything in place, put it all in order to show the love to Ethan and to show the love to the sister as well. Amen. So we can get anxious about stuff. We can look at things badly, but really... It was instantaneously I saw, I was like, no, God used this. It wasn't bad. It wasn't. And he flipped it on its head what the enemy thought was for evil, for bad. And God's like, uh-huh, watch this. And he flipped it. Now, let me tell you a quick story. I got, I got time. I'm going a little long. But a quick story of how we can forget about it, right? I can have instantaneous, not have any anxiety, but we come home from our vacation and we're in the parking garage and our van is dead. We're in a parking garage that's hot, van's dead, and I start getting anxious. So it's crazy, right? Like we can feel ourselves. We have to trust in the Lord in every situation, take every thought captive, right? And look for his hand in everything. All right, so Matthew 6, let's get going back on. I'm going to give you some more weapons on how to take these thoughts captive and what you should do. Let's read some scripture here. Matthew 6, 27. And which of you by worrying can add a single day to his lifespan. Matthew 6, 34. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. First Peter. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, having cast all your anxiety on him, because he compares, he, because he cares about you. And I heard the word all. That's all. Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is comfortable, my burden is light. Colossians 3. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks through him to God the Father. So in whatever you do, you're to give thanks. Amen. So as the band comes up, I encourage you to stand right now. And as we get ready to close, I want to read this scripture right here. These last two. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness, most gladly, therefore, I'd rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ, Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weakness, in insults, in distress, in persecutions, in difficulties, in behalf of Christ. For I, when I am weak, then I am strong. And I say that to encourage you. I know God can grow this leg back right now if he wanted to. But I also know that God's allowed me to be in a spot where I'm at right now because I'm able to reach people that I never would have been able to reach, preach a message that I never would have been able to preach, and have somebody receive it that would never be able to receive it if it wasn't for what has happened. So whatever circumstance you're in, I encourage you, stop looking at the negative and look what God can do when you allow him to use you. 2 Corinthians 4. 
Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer person is decaying, yet our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Change your focus to the internal. Stop looking at the things of this world. So as we close, I encourage the altar team to come forward. This doesn't mean you're not going to have anxieties, depression, PTSD start coming back up to you. The enemy is going to try to attack. I've told you. It just recently happened this week for me. One time I failed and one time I was great at it, right? I was talking to somebody before service and they said a win is a win. A win is a win. That's a win that you never would have had before. Right? Those aren't my words. That's somebody else's. So don't give me credit. A win is a win. So take that. Take that. We have to remember, right? We got to remember to take these as they come and do what the Father does and make everything work for the glory of God. Focus on the things not of this world. So as we close, I encourage you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're in here dealing with specifically anxiety, depression, PTSD, whatever it is, medicines alone are not going to fix you. They're only going to cover it up. You can turn to other things, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, is not going to cure it. It's a temporary release. You need to give it to the Lord. And you need to come to the front and lay it down at the altar. Partner with somebody up here. Have them pray with you. That is truly how you're going to find freedom and be released from that. Stop listening to the lies about this is how God's made you or you have to deal with this. He hasn't made you that way. What we need to do is pray. We need to dig into his word daily. We need to soak with him. We need to fast with him. We need a Sabbath which is resting. We need to rest in his word. We need to rest in his word. We need to believe in his promises. The yes and amen. They are true. When life comes at you, because it's going to, you need to focus on the things that are not of this world. Focus on God. See what he's doing in your life. Rejoice at what he's doing in your life this is what you need to do. Day by day then, you start to forget. Day by day, things go away. You're like, I didn't even remember it that day. I didn't even have a bad thought that day. It truly becomes easier. That's where freedom comes from. So I encourage you. This is how I want to end today as we're getting running a little late. I encourage you as I pray, after I get done praying, or while I'm praying, come to the front. Come to the front. If you haven't given your life.